I think I shared with you uh, the fact that uh, in this one little town we was in, they didn't have a church that had services on a Sunday night. Nobody had church on Sunday night. This seems to be one of the things that's happening. And it's so sad because I think we're losing, you know, when we do that. Tonight, if you have your Bibles with you, I want to turn again to the book of Colossians. I want to read from chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, and talk to you about something I think is so tremendous. The grace of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy, and beloved, bounds of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man hath a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgive you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity or love, which is a bond of perfection. Let us go to the Lord and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to come to you just now. We want to praise you. We want to thank you. You have, you just, I cannot ex uh, express what is on my heart and in my life of what you have done for me, for me individually. But I want to thank you, and I want to praise you for that. I also want to thank you and praise you for what you've done for this congregation and this church. You have been so good to us. I know uh, I can remember back when we first started here, there was all kinds of questions. Can it ever, anything ever take place? Can you ever find a, ever find a place to build a building and all that? And, here we have all this land now. Uh, you have blessed us in so many ways. And for those people, many of our people who are here in the beginning have gone on to glory. And I know that they're up there cheering us on, saying, keep on keeping on. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for this church. I thank you for what you're going to do in the days to come. I thank you for the many, many wonderful things you have in store for your people. But most of all, for the fact that one day we'll all come together around the throne of grace and we'll praise you continually. We'll serve you and do whatever it is that you have for each one of us to do. Thank you, Lord God. I do pray if there's one here tonight who doesn't know you as a personal Savior, that tonight they would open up their hearts and invite the Lord Jesus Christ to come in. And for Christians, I pray that we would uh, uh, truly live the way you'd have us to live and live, be in the center of your will with our lives. Thank you for all that you've done and what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, in these verses of Scripture that I've read to you, God gives four motives that ought to be to encourage us to just simply walk in the newness of life. You know, grace is God's favor to the undeserving sinner. We don't deserve it. But he, he saved us. <laughs> and Paul reminds the Colossians what grace has done for them. And that's what I want us to look at tonight. The Colossian church faced all kinds of problems, but, God, but Paul zeroes in on what Christ had really done for that church and for each individual. Now the word elect, it means chosen of God. You know, uh, a lot of people have trouble with this thing of grace. <laughs> you know, it just simply means that God has chosen you for no other reason, for no reason. I don't know why. I don't know why he chose me. I, you know, sometimes that's, that's hard for people to understand. I think perhaps, you know, uh, Moses might be able to help us a little bit there, to help us to understand the meaning of what uh, salvation by grace is all about. 
in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, here's what he had to say. Talking about the children of Israel, he said, The Lord did not send his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord God loved you and brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Why didn't you? It's the grace of God. God loved them and he brought them out with a mighty hand. The miracle of divine election did not depend upon anything that we, does not depend upon anything we do or who we are or what we are or anything that we've done. God had just simply chosen us in Christ and he did that before the foundation of the earth. That's, you know, that's hard for people to really understand. You're talking to somebody, trying to witness someone and trying to tell them that, well, it's just hard for people to understand that. Now, God does not save a sinner on the basis of his merit, his works. If he did, none of us would be saved because we haven't done anything that would merit him saving us. I know this guy has. It's all through. Here it is. It's all through the grace of Almighty God. And why? so that it might bring glory to God. It might bring glory to God himself. Now, this thing of election throws people. Sometimes you hear someone say, well, why should I go out and witness to somebody? Why should I talk to somebody about Christ if God is already going to save him? He knows who he's going to save and all that. Well, it's not up to you and I to explain to a lost sinner what the uh, salvation by grace or election is all about. That's up to God, you see. And 2 Timothy 19, uh, 2 19 says, The Lord knows them who are His. He knows who it is He's going to say, but we don't know. I don't know. And so therefore I'm to go out and I'm to witness and I'm to tell people the good news, share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with other people. Now God knows everything, and He knows who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. You know. But that doesn't lessen the fact that you and I are to tell people about Jesus Christ and His wonderful, glorious love for them. Second thing you notice here, He says God set them apart. By the meaning of the word holy, or that's the meaning of the word holy. God has just simply set them apart. Because uh, we have trusted God, we've been set apart from the world unto the Lord. When you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, you were set apart. You become a child of God, and you're set apart from the world. You're not to be a part of the world out there doing the thing. You're going to live in this old world, but you're not to, you're not to be a part of all the things that goes on in the world. We're not our own. We belong to Him. We've been bought by His wonderful, precious blood. It's kind of like a marriage ceremony. You know, uh, a marriage sets a woman set marriage ceremony, such a part of man and a woman, for each other exclusively. You know, and salvation, that's what salvation does. Salvation sets a believer apart exclusively for the Lord Jesus Christ. When you're saved, you become a child of God. You become a part of the family of God. Amen. And you do not want to be then a part of the things of the world. I don't know, but so many people uh, claim to be God's children and yet they want to live, do the things of the world. They want to act like the world, want to be part of that. Yes, that happens to us sometimes. But when that happens, a true child of God will confess his sins and come back to the Lord and then get on with living his life. You know, it, when a, a person really 
truly lives and, and, and does and be is what God wants him to be, then I tell you, it's be a tremendous, tremendous thing that God will do for us. So, God sets us apart. Thirdly, God loves them. When a non-believer sins, he is a creature breaking the law of a holy God, his creator, and his judge. But when a Christian sins, you know what? He's breaking the law or breaking the heart of a loving, heavenly father. When you sin, see, when a, when a guy out there who's not a Christian, he sins, well, he's breaking God's law, yes. But when a Christian sins, oh, listen to me, when a Christian sins, Ah, he breaks a heart of oh, God, his Father. Because we know that we're doing that which is wrong. Love, love is the strongest motivating power in the world. As a believer grows in his love for God, he will grow in his desire to obey God, to walk in the newness of life. He will want to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Every day of your life. You know what? If you'll just do that, grow like Christ, become more like Him. And every day of your life, try to be a little better. Now, I know that's hard to do. That's hard for me to do. You know, because you live in this old world and the world will just try to tear you down. Got all kinds of things that will throw up against you. But, if you'll just remember who you belong to, and you are one of God's children, I tell you this, he'll help you along the way. Then, notice in verse 13, God has forgiven them for bearing one another and forgiven one another. God's forgiveness, by the way, is complete. And it's final, you know. It's not conditional or partial. The question comes sometimes, how can a holy God forgive us who are guilty sinners? Well, the way he forgives us and the reason he forgives us is because of the sacrifice of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on Calvary's cross. Ephesians 4.12 says, God has forgiven us for Christ's sake. Because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross, God has forgiven us. And all of this, by the way, just simply adds up to the grace of God. All of it. <laughs> now, Paul mentions eight graces here. And we'll just take a look at those very quickly. First of all, tender mercy. As a believer, we need to display tender mercies or feelings of compassion toward one another. Boy, if there's anything we need, we need that, right? This is not something we turn on and off like the television set. It's a constant attitude of the heart that makes us easy to live with. I hope you're easy to live with. <laughs> many, uh, many marriages, you know, husband and wives, it's not easy to live with a wife, you know. Uh, it's always causing you trouble or what have you, or vice versa. But we know that we do it. Sometimes Christians can have some of the meanest fights or something that you would run into. Why would they do that? Well, you know what? It's because... We're not truly walking with the Lord. We're not letting him lead us and direct our lives the way he wants to. So, you know, we're to have this constant attitude of heart that makes us easy to get along with, easy to live with. You know, I, I pray that you're, you're one of those people who others like to be around. You know, there's some people you just like to be around. You know that? I'm sure you do. Come on. There's some people you don't want to be around, don't you? Yeah, you say, oh, I don't know, but I don't want to be around that guy. 
I want to be with her. Okay, second thing he mentions is kindness. We're saved because of God's kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. So we in turn ought to show kindness toward other people. Be you kind to one another. Uh, you know, it's God's command. Ephesians 4, 4 23. Just simply being kind. Doing some kind acts. Helping people. This morning, you know, I, I have to just simply say this. That, uh, the young lady that's here, I can't remember her name. She's a nurse. She was there on hand. Our brother back there, he's always there. Thank you. And I know they said to for me to tell all of you they wanted to thank you for all the things that was done here this morning and all of that. So just simply being kind, doing, doing an act of kindness, whatever it might be. I think we all want that. Third thing he mentions is humbleness of mind. Hmm. Now the pagan world did that. The pagan world did not, uh, uh, you know, admire humility. They wanted the, the, the pagan world, they admired people who were in power, people who had dominion over them, or whatever it might be. I think the Lord Jesus Christ himself is the greatest example of humility. He was humble. And you just see it in his life. You know. Now, humility is not, you know, not thinking of oneself as having the, uh, you know, Always thinking of yourself being, you know, number one or what have you. It has to do with the, having the proper estimation of yourself, who you really are. And I take a look at myself, I realize I'm nobody. Yet in the sight of God, you know, I am someone. Because He loves me and He's concerned about me. But, you know, I'm no better than anyone else. I think we need to we need to see that. You know. A person who is humble of mind, he thinks of others first and not of himself. You think of those who are hurting, those who need your help or what have you, instead of always thinking about yourself. Then the fourth thing you mention is meekness. Now let me say this to you, meekness is not weakness. A lot of people think that. You know, you see people, you know, and they say, boy, oh, that guy's so meek, <laughs> what have you. No, meekness is power under control. I don't know how many of you ever, ever rode a horse, worked a horse, or anything like that. But a horse, you know, that's broke, that horse still has all of its power. Yet, you can take just a little bit and put it in his mouth and, and make the horse go right, left, or any other way. See, still meat, but still has its power. It will obey. So here it is, a weak person does not have to plow for handle because, he, you know what? He has everything that he needs. You and I, <laughs> we have everything that we need. We have it because the Lord has given it to us. And all we need to do is just simply trust Him. We don't have to be, you know, somebody powerful or all that. We just have to simply be where we'll let God use us in the way that He wants to. Then, of course, number five, He lists long suffering. <laughs> this word here means literally long-tempered. Now think about this for a minute. The short-tempered person speaks and acts on impulse and lacks control. Hmm. When a person is long-suffering, he can put up with just about anything. He can put up with people provoking him or any kind of circumstances. He doesn't get upset when people retaliate against him. Now, it is true there are some things that we should get angry about. 
I mean, abortion, homosexuality, all of that, those kind of things, we should be angry about it, we should be upset about it. But for the most part, most people are upset, not over those things, they're upset and long-tempered over things that really doesn't mean a hill of beans. <clears throat> you know, we just do that. So, be long-suffering. And then number six, forbearance. Forbearance means to hold up or hold back. You know, God holds back his judgment towards sinners. And aren't you glad of that? <laughs> oh, my goodness, dear friends. The things that I've done in my life or what have you, if God had zapped me every time, I'd have been gone long ago. But God is a forgiven God. And he wants to forgive me. So if we'll come to him and cry out to him, then he will forgive us. And he'll hold back his judgment toward us. Oh, that should make all of us shout glory, hallelujah. You know, by the way, meekness, forbearance, and long-suffering, all of these three go together. All of them. And then, of course, number seven, he talks about forgiveness. It is not enough. It's not enough that a Christian in your, in your grief and provocation and refuse to retaliate, he must forgive the troublemaker. Now, I, you know, you're going to run into people in this old world who will uh, try to do something to you, hurt you, or whatever it might be, cause you trouble. You're to forgive them. <coughs> you know, we're not to hold a grudge against them. Someone has said that the, the greatest burden you'll ever carry is a grudge, or the heaviest load you'll ever carry is a grudge. Right. And if you do that, you'll find out that that'll get heavier by the year, by the day, week, and then and by the year. So what you have to do is cry out to God and ask God to forgive you, and He will forgive you, and then you can forgive the person who has harmed or hurt you in any way. By the way, it's Christ-like to forgive. You remember on the cross, he forgave those who had crucified him. You know. By the way, forgiveness opens a heart to the fullness of God's love. You know, it's very interesting. We have a, a complaint against another person, whatever it might be, we should forgive him. And if we'll forgive them, our hearts uh, will be, not only will we be blessed, our hearts will be open and, and we'll be willing to love and share and help and do. But not only that, we must go to the person and seek help, uh, seek to help them in whatever way we can. This forgiveness, by the way, is a two-way street. If you and I have a problem, you know, and uh, I come to you and ask for your forgiveness. Well, then, as a Christian, you're to forgive me, and I'll forgive you. And then we'll walk away, two of God's children, happy, enjoying life to its fullest. That's what we're doing. But the last thing you mentioned is what? Well, you know, love. <laughs> Put on love. Now, this is the most important of all Christian virtues. He's mentioned these other seven, but this, this love, it acts like a girdle that ties all other things together. All the spiritual qualities that Paul has mentioned really are aspects of true Christian love. You know what? If you love someone, you know what? All these other things will be easy. Forgiveness, forbearance, long-suffering, all of that will be easy if you're willing to just simply love. Now, sometimes it's hard for people to love, isn't it? I think about, you said in the book of Genesis on, on Wednesday night, I think about Jacob. We haven't got that far yet in our look at Genesis, but Jacob, you remember Jacob? 
Well, he worked seven years for a woman named Rachel. And in seven years, he got, after seven years, he got the wrong woman. He got Leah instead of Rachel. But you know what the Bible said? He didn't mind it. It seemed like only a few days for him. You know why? Because he was in love with her. And that's what love is all about. By the way, love is the first of the fruits of the Spirit. Love is so very important for the child of God. First of all, God loved you so much. He loved you so much that He gave His only begotten Son that if you just simply believe in Him, you could have eternal, everlasting life. God loved you. Now, if you're saved, what are you to do? You're to love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul. But not only that, you know what? You might not want to, but you're to love me. <laughs> you're to, we're to love one another. We're to love our neighbors. As a matter of fact, you know it, don't you? You're to love your enemies. Huh. Now that's not easy to do, is it? But that's what we do. All these virtues, you know, peace, joy, joy long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness. When love really rules in our hearts and our lives and unite all of these things together and we'll be able to just simply be what God wants us to be. Now I know and you know that we'll have setbacks. There'll be days when things won't go right. There'll be times when you will uh, uh, find that it's hard to forgive. It's hard to be kind. All of these things. But that's what we strive to do. Paul writing to the church at Colossae is saying to those people, listen, it's all by the grace of God that you are where you're at. You're God's children. Now, these are the things that you're to do. And Paul would say that to the church here, Friendship Baptist Church. Those are the things that we... We, these are the virtues that we're to have. And these are the things that we are to do. But most of all, let love rule in your lives. It, it unites all of these spiritual virtues together. <laughs> There's beauty and harmony in all of this when we truly do that. Here, here's the thing about it, dear friends. When we love one another with a Christ-like love, then we'll find ourselves having less trouble of forgiving others, being kind to other people, being meek, all of that. So, please, when you think about these things, remember, first of all, it's a grace of God, by the grace of God, that you're saved. And then, because of that, because of what God has done in your life, then you will want to do these things for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, tonight, as I think of my own life, I realize that I come up short in many of these virtues that you've mentioned. <coughs> but I do know this, that you love me. You love me so much that you're willing to send your son to die on a cruel, cruel cross for me. And in the light of that, sure, I can love you, I can serve you, and I can do my best when it comes to these other things that we've mentioned here. I pray tonight, Lord God, if there's one individual here who does not know you, that tonight they'll open up their hearts and invite the Lord Jesus Christ to come in. And I pray for Christians. I pray that we will just simply truly love you to the very best 
of our ability. And when we do that, we find out that other things just simply fall in place. Forgive us, Lord, where we have failed you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.